Hello, I'm Mary Fate and welcome to Cover to Cover. The show is presented by Writing WA and it's our opportunity to find out about new West Australian books. My guest today is Pat Lowe to talk about the book Two Sisters, which was published recently by Broome-based Indigenous publisher Magabala Books. Thanks for being here, Pat. Thanks, Mary. It's good to be here. Now, it was a really fortuitous meeting that you had with Jimmy Pike uh, when he was in prison in Broome in the mid-80s, which led you to a, a large chunk of the rest of your life, in fact, to this point, but including meeting these two sisters, Nada and Jugana. Tell me how you met them. Well, I met them through Jimmy. Um, they were his close relations. And uh, they came to Broome and uh, they visited Jimmy and uh, conveyed um, messages to him. So, but you <coughs> were living up there at the time, so you got to know both of them quite well. Yeah, I got to know them independently, actually. Jugana came up with her husband to visit Jimmy, and that's how I met her first. And then later on, when I went to the desert, I met, um, or before I went to the desert, actually, I met Narda and her husband. But they were both <coughs> living in Fitzroy at the time, is that right? Um, yes, uh, they lived in Fitzroy Crossing, They'd come out of the desert, uh, as we've discovered in the late 50s and um, early, early 60s. 60s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you took down Nada's story painstakingly over many years. What was that experience like? <clears throat> well, you have to understand that I went to live in the desert with Jimmy on the edge of the desert when he was doing his parole. And um, Nada was a frequent visitor to the camp that we were at. She and her husband had also come from the desert, both of them. And um, <clears throat> they, you know, we'd have conversations. And uh, also, Jimmy told me about her story, about what had happened to her when she was a child. And um, I, I was fascinated by this and thought, um, this, this is a story that needs to be recorded. It was most unusual, um, her having been fleeing murderers and so on. And so uh, I spoke to her about that and said, would she mind if I wrote her story? And she was very happy to do that. So we spent time sitting down out in, the, in our camp. Uh, and of course, we couldn't just do it all in one hit. You had to take opportunities as they arose to, to, um, l for me to learn a bit more. And mostly I recorded pen and pencil. I was interested in how you recorded it because mm. it's one of those things where immediately that you begin to formalise a conversation that it can become quite stilted, can't it? So you would have had to have been fa fairly kind mm. of calm and a bit surreptitious about, you know, making sure that you were, <coughs> that the conversation was a formal conversation about her storytelling but that you weren't. Well, she knew I was writing it down yeah. but um, if I tried to find a recorder or something like that, then of course that would kill the moment. Yes. And by the time I find the batteries are flat and so on, you know, the moment's gone. Yeah. So I stopped doing that and I used to just, I always had pen and paper handy, pencil and paper handy. Nada and Jugan are, are two full sisters. Full sisters. Um, and the, the way that the, the book is constructed is that you've taken down Nada's story, as, as we've just talked about, o over a long period of time. But the Jugana actually wrote her <coughs> story uh, in her Walmajari language, which we'll talk about in a moment. But I just want to go back, first of all, to uh, this these two stories, which were about the exodus from the desert. Um, just to set uh, the context of what was going on at the time that was causing these tribes, these big family groups, to move out to the point where I think by the time Nada was there, on her, it was about eight people left yeah. in her group. <clears throat> well, um, the cattle stations had been taken over by um, Gadia, which is white people, and uh, the news of that had gone back to the desert because the people who lived closest to the cattle stations, of course, or on the cattle stations, were worked there. And some of them, um, many of them, were related to people who were in the desert. So during holiday time, they used to go back to the desert sometimes, some of them did, to visit relations. Mm. And every time they went back with stories about the stations, about all the plentiful food and um, the, the meat, you know, the cattle that you could just kill and you had meat for, the, for ages. Mm. And um, all sorts of stories came back. So of course people It was an attractive attracted. proposition. It was, it was attractive. Mm. Also, I think it was fairly hard times in the desert. There had been a bit of a drought. I gather. So 
you know, it was harder to get food. Mm. And um, so people gradually leached from the desert with the, their relations. And um, Jimmy Pike was one of those who left. Um, he told me that story. He, you know, asked his mother if he could go. He was still a boy, yeah. and he went with his sister, who was older and had got married and gone to the cattle station. Mm. You see, so that's how the links were, and um, and then Ngada and Jugana were his technically his nieces, but Jugana was the same age as Jimmy, which um, is about my age, and mm. uh, Ngada was about five years younger, I would say. Mm. But of course, we don't know their dates of birth or anything. Yeah. But there was <coughs> another driving force as well because there were the, the, the two murderers, which you, you mentioned before, who were from another desert group? Yes, they were Manjuljara speakers. And uh, it's hard to know quite their history, but Jimmy told me that they were known to be um, sort of outlaws, really, is how, how I see it, even from their own groups. And they'd killed quite a few people in the desert <coughs> before, including um, another relation of Jimmy's, and well, w who's related, of course, to Ngada and Jugana. Mm. Yeah, and so uh, when most people had left the desert, including Jugana, who'd gone with her husband, Ngada was left behind. She stayed behind through choice with her grandmother, whom she was very attached to. And her grandmother didn't want to leave and was infirm. She had a bad back, and um, so didn't want to go with everybody else. So she stayed, chose to stay with her grandmother. And then, um, <clears throat> so in the end, there was just this group of women and children left behind in the mm. desert. And suddenly these two murderers, who were brothers, um, appeared out of nowhere <clears throat> and um, speared several members of the group. They speared her grandmother, her aunt, you know, several members of the group, including her younger brother. And uh, so Nada herself, was frightened, of course. Everyone was terrified of these people, and said so. They took over the group essentially, <clears throat> and um, so Nada said to her mother, um, "They're going to kill us if we stay. Let's run away." Uh, run away, and her mother was afraid to, and wouldn't go. So she left on her own at night. And when I sat with <clears throat> that idea of being in the desert and running away, I mean. You, you must be visible for a long distance away from whatever waterhole you have. Visible's to. got nothing to do with it. Your tracks. Right, of course. Yeah. So they, they, they'd find you eventually anyway. So it was an incredibly brave thing because she was a teenager at the time. Yes. She, well, yes. She went by herself. She went by herself. And how long was she by herself in the desert? Well, though? people say, she said and others said, um, about a year. It's amazing. And avoiding being tracked by Stepping on well, tufts. Of well, when she left the camp, she walked on the grass, as they call it, which, of course, is that spi spiky spin effect. Um, she walked on that to hide her footprints mm. so that they perhaps didn't know which direction she went. They eventually caught up with her, though. Well, <clears throat> she went back. And um, she went back because I think she was, in, she was torn. She, she, she'd never been to the cattle stations before. She knew where her relations were. They described the journey. And so she f probably had some sense of how to get there. But of course, she had to find the water holes on the way. And um, she got so far. And then I think she lost her nerve. Mm. Better the devil you know than the devil yeah. you don't know. Um, I've asked, I asked her several times, why did you go back? And she'd always say, I don't know why I went back. And then I put words into her mouth, really. I said, um, were you frightened? And she said, maybe I was frightened. <laughs> so she couldn't really explain going back. Yeah. But I suppose it's, you know, the fear of the cattle stations, you know, the, she was alone, mm. a young girl. Mm, very timid, <coughs> no doubt. Um, and what I also marveled at in the, in the telling of, the stories are told quite contrastingly, although there's a lot of crossover between their experiences, obviously, uh, was the understatement of the, the drama. I mean, what you've just described in terms of the two murderers coming in and slaying half of her family in front of her. And I, I remember the part that it really struck me that the mother was not allowed to cry for the boy. No, the mother had gone down. They'd sent her to get water. And she comes back with water and her son's not there and everyone's crying or, you know, head down. They weren't crying. I suppose they weren't crying, but they had their head down. Mm. And she um, realized that her son had been killed. She started to cry. And the 
two men told her, don't, don't cry or we'll kill you. Mm. Mm. So all the drama and the brutality is it's told in this very understated, understated yes. way. Yes, Ngata was a very stoical woman mm. in m many respects, yeah. And did you find that too with Jugana? I mean, her, her story was told, uh, I felt, more optimistically in some ways. Yes, well, Jugana didn't have that experience. She um, had left before, and um, about three years before, I think, and gone to the cattle station with her husband, mm. following the footprints of Jimmy. At, well, she went, Jimmy actually took her husband out the first time. Um, and showed him where to go, came back and got him um, and other people and then he came back and claimed his wife and they, they left. Um, so she'd gone and her story is largely about what it was like to live in the desert in the early days. Um, I say early days, I mean before contact mm. with, um, with modern life, you know. And <clears throat> it's a very beautiful story, I think, beautifully written very simple, but it tells you so much about desert life. Mm. And, uh, and then, of course, not having heard from her sister or her mother or any of the other family members for so long, she assumed they'd been killed because they knew about the murderers. And so she assumed they must have died because they hadn't appeared or anything. Um, and then, eventually, this little group, including the murderers, comes out. And uh, the news, of course, spread immediately. They're here. They're mm. still alive, some of them. Mm. Yeah. Which would have, uh, I was interested to, to remind myself that, um, that Nada and Jugana, when they were kids, were not the best of buddies. Either. No, that's there was a right. bit of jealousy between them, too. That's so, right. were, you know, it's just kind of amused me to think of, you know, that, you know, that relationship being rekindled again. Yes, that's did right. It, did it become that way again, very, very much? The yeah, they became of, pretty close. Yeah, oh, yes. that's wonderful. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and in fact, it was Jugana who. Uh, came on a tractor from, yeah. Ngada came out at um, Christmas Creek Station. Jugana, meanwhile, was living on Cherubin Station, which is some distance away. So they came on a tractor, tractor. <coughs> to, when they heard, to see Ngada mm -hmm. and introduced her to, this is your husband, <laughs> to uh, uh, um, <coughs> Huey, his name was. Yeah. Mm. Um, so you took down Nada's story, uh, as we've talked about, but then there's there's somebody else in this in this mix of bringing two sisters to life, and that's Eilis Richards, who yes. uh, was also uh, she's a linguist, who is who was mm -hmm. up in the region at the time, and she was taking down the Wamajari language. Yes, yes, Eilis is a linguist, and um, she came up in her twenties to study with another linguist, Joyce Hudson, to study the Walmajeri language and to actually translate the Bible into Walmajeri, which is something that people had requested. And so they undertook that and they also wrote a dictionary and lots of other things. Um, and Jugana had only been out of the desert for a few years at that point, became one of their main informants about her language. So she taught them her language and they taught her how to write it because mm -hmm. uh, they came up with an a writing method system um, for spelling the words, you know. And she, so she became literate in her own language, but not in English. She never really grasped English all that well because she was just passionate about her own language. As in not to speak or to write? Um, her speech was all right. Mm. Not great, but it was, it was fine for somebody who'd come out, you know, of the desert as a young woman. But... Um, but it was Walma Jerry that she was passionate about. She loved her language, and she used to teach it in the school um, later on. Once she'd learned it, she taught it and wanted to maintain both that and the knowledge of the desert. Mm. So if you went on a desert trip with her, as I did, in fact, she hosted some Americans um, at one stage. And uh, she's just a natural student and a natural teacher. And so she, you'd see her looking for things to show people and explain the uses of them and so on. She was a, a wonderful um, companion in the desert. Yeah. So she wrote her story in her language on bits of note paper. Well, this is what um, I sort of, yeah, perhaps should have said earlier. Um, it, the English translation is lovely, but it was based on this um, Walmajeri uh, original, which mine was not because I'm not a linguist and 
couldn't, tra couldn't have translated mm. that. So it was quite different. So she came along to Alice one day with a bunch of papers and said, um, I've written this, you might be interested. So it was her little life story. I say little because it wasn't very big, very long. Um, but she'd written it all in Walmajerry. Mm. And that must be such an unusual thing for somebody to have written their life story in their own lang you know, Aboriginal language. Um, Do those bits of notepaper still exist? No, sadly. Ooh. I've asked, yeah. You know, you don't always value these things at the time. You don't realize how important they are. Um, so Eilis translated it, and then she showed it to me. And I said, well, it's lovely. Um, but it needs more because, um, you know, she hadn't gone into much detail about lots of her life uh, after coming out of mm. the desert. So, so Alice worked with her and they talked about the early life and she wrote down more and Alice translated more until we had a, a fuller story of her life. So both the both uh, mm. Jugana's story in Walmajari and the translation are both in Two Sisters, which is just beautiful to see as well. And um, I wanted to go back to what you were talking about with Jugana's kind of concern for making sure that the language survived, because of course the Walmajari who are in Fitzroy, they're, they're, I mean, they're, they're permanently dispossessed of their land really, aren't they? Yes. Does anyone live out in the desert even temporarily these days? Well, um, yes and no. There are desert communities. I mean, there are big desert communities at Balgo, Billaluna, and so on. But they're like small towns. Mm. So people do still have maintained some of their activities from before, go hunting especially, and those sorts of things. But now they travel by car, and um, they don't walk the land in a 360-degree way mm. anymore, the mm. way they used to. Um, also, there are outstations, like where Jimmy and I um, lived to start with. Uh, near there, there's a, an outstation that consists of just four houses, I think. And um, uh, the, his relations used that. Mm. So but never the same, it never the true desert no, life. No, not 100%. Nomadic life. No. Because there was so much walking, wasn't there? There was just continuous walking, hunting and gathering. Exactly, mm. yes. And, uh, of course, we recaptured a little bit of that when I was out there, yeah. Mm. Well, and Jimmy the used to love to do that. People used to love to go back to the desert. You'd notice that it was interesting going out to the desert with those people who'd come from there. There was a lifting of spirits mm. when they got out there. They were suddenly animated. This was their country. They were in charge. We were the, you know, any non-Aboriginal people were, were the learners, the students, you know, yeah. um, and fascinated by it all. So it was complete reversal from town where the rules are all made by, you know, the mainstream and so on. Yeah, I remember yeah. you telling me in an earlier conversation about how you kind of really sensed the boredom of being in town and how, as you've just said, they, they really were re revitalised by being back on really? the land yes. again. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you were actually able to help with the Walmajari too, in the as in for, for Eilis and for Joyce, in the sense that you, although you don't speak it, as I understand, you were able to um, give them additional information that helped them to pull their dictionary together. Oh, that was earlier on, yes. Well, because when they did their dictionary, they were mostly in Fitzroy Crossing. They didn't spend much time in the desert. They did do a trip or, or so, I'm not sure. but. Um, whereas I was living out there, okay. so Jimmy would tell me the names of obscure things. When I say obscure, we don't have words for them in English, mm. like the hollows in the sand hills, you know. Mm. And so I'd be relaying some of that back to Joyce and Alice, who, um, for their dictionary, I'd say, mm. I wonder if you got this word. Of course, they did have quite a few of the words that I came up with. But because you're in situ, you are referring to these things. People are referring to these things that they grew up with, whereas in town they don't because there's no cause to. You know? mm. And I know it's far from the full dictionary, but there is a glossary of terms yes. in Two Sisters as well. And the other thing that I wanted to mention before was that there, but there are some uh, wonderful photographs of you out in the desert. They, it looks like they were t taken a while ago, obviously, because Jugger oh, and yes. Nada are both <laughs> alive. In don't worry, the, people, both people say to me sometimes, oh, you're so old now, <laughs> you're so young. <laughs> in, the, in the photos. But one of the stories that I love, and there is a photograph of it in there, is when you went 
uh, to one of the water holes and Nada found a grinding stone? Yes, we went to Dabu, which is the main water hole of her country. And um, she'd spent quite a lot of time around that water hole. People, of course, moved from one water hole to another, hunting and gathering food and so on. And, uh, and we went there, and that was my first visit to there. And uh, she came over to me very quietly and just uh, told me to come and have a look. And she showed me this big grinding stone that had belonged to her grandmother mm. that she'd just stashed under a tree. Because people didn't carry those. They left them at the water hole, of course for future use, it was too heavy to carry. Mm. And, um, and there were the grooves in the grinding stone and some y red ochre that she must have been grinding up. How did it, did it affect her to find it? Could you see? Yes, she was m quite moved. Mm. Mm. It's very, um, when she was moved, she was serious. She didn't cry, she was just very serious. Mm. Uh, Nida and Jugana have both passed away now, but yeah. I know towards her later life you became quite close to Jugana, didn't you? I did, yes. Jugana used to, um, well, she, was, she had um, renal failure, and so she was on dialysis. And the dialysis hostel uh, that she s came to stay at is round the corner from my house. So she used to come and visit me when she wasn't on dialysis, the days that she was off dialysis. And she'd do some painting there. Um, I used to order... Uh, canvases from her from Munkaja Arts in Fitzroy Crossing. They'd send them up and she would do some paintings. Um, and when she wasn't painting or if she'd used up her canvases, because she was quite prolific, she um, would sometimes tell me stories. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, I can't help writing them down because to me, that is being lost. You know, people, there are very few people now, first contact mm. still around. There are people, but you know, they're, we're losing them. Mm. And uh, so I'd write these stories down. And I'd ask her questions about things that interested me. I was always interested in people's dogs. And she always remembered her dogs by name and, and character. You know? yeah. and, um, and then I w w we were collecting all these stories. And I said, why don't we try and publish them? So we published them in another little book. Uh, I remember because of the Nada's story originally was uh, you first published it in 1991 in the Westerly and then worked on it quite a lot since then as well. And I, I know that the book was published by Fremantle Press in the early 2000s, so this is a, a, a second publishing. But uh, one of the things that I remember from, from the Westerly was that uh, you and Eilis had both described uh, this the exodus into I guess into the western the westernized part of of Western Australia as l or having biblical overtones and that it was one of the great untold Australian stories w why does it feel like that to you well a whole people had been living there um, and not just the war Majeri, other desert groups um, language groups had been living down in that country that desert country we call it desert <laughs> um, for centuries, I mean, mm. so long. And, uh, and then within a generation or two, they were all gone. Mm. It was empty, apart from you know, a few communities that grew up. And um, to me, that's uh, it's a sadness, mm. really. And yeah, it's like a, well, yeah. it's a story that doesn't often get thought about or mm. told. Oh, it's true, and, and, and it is beautiful. How does it make you feel to see it in this beautiful publication? Oh, I think that Magabal has done a wonderful job with it. I'm really grateful to them for having gone to that trouble. They did take a lot of trouble with it. Yeah, yeah. It is beautiful, and it's got lots of really interesting elements to it, some of which we've touched on and some of which we haven't got to. Um, Pat, each month I ask my guest about a recommendation for a West Australian book, uh, and you're recommending Once in Broome by Sally Bin Demon. Yes. Tell me more about the book. Well, it's a lovely book about uh, the 1940s, maybe, from then, um, 50s and so on, uh, in Broome, her early life. And it's part of the, the pleasure of the book is, is the historical information. But the other part is her style, her, her tone. It's such a generous book, really, and very um, warm-hearted. And she doesn't dwell on the hard part. But you can read it in the subtext, sort of thing. In, in that same understated That's kind of right, way. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so I, I loved reading it myself, even though you know I live in Broome and know a bit about the history. But uh, it, it was a great read, and I've you know given it to people as a mm. present and recommended it. Yes. 
I feel like b before we end our conversation, we should acknowledge Nada and Jugana because it is their stories that have been published in this and, and about the, the remarkable uh, historical significance of this publication. But thank you so much for joining me to talk about it today. It's been obviously a fascinating journey for you as well. Thank you, Mary. Yes, it has. We select the books we feature on cover to cover because we think they'll generate strong discussion in book clubs. We've created book club notes for Two Sisters and all the other books we've discussed on the show. You can download the notes from the For Readers section of our website. We've made a special arrangement for viewers who can't buy our featured books locally. If you place your order with Crow Books in Perth by phone, mention the code cover to cover and you'll get the postage free. Next month on Cover to Cover, I'll be joined by two guests to discuss their favourite children's books of 2016. They've each chosen a picture book, a book for middle readers and a young adult title to recommend. Thanks again for sending through your feedback about Cover to Cover. It's always good to hear from you. If you'd like to get in touch with us, please use the email address shown on the screen. If you'd like to find out more about Writing WA and the wide range of services we have to support writers in Western Australia, have a look through our website and encourage writers in your communities to do the same. Enjoy reading local and I look forward to your company next month on Cover to Cover. <laughs>